Meditations with Ryan Slomack. Welcome, listeners. Uh, we made it. We made it to October. We're in spooky season, and uh, things are about to get weird because that's what happens in spooky season. So, for those of you who are uh, coming back for the marathon that is uh, the Meditations with Ryan Zlomak show. Thanks so much. I really appreciate you uh, scoping out my really cool guests. For those of you who are joining for the first time, this is a show all about making space for conversation from people from all walks of life, figuring out what makes people tick, what makes people uh, passionate about certain uh, topics and ideas, and most importantly, giving ourselves a chance to learn from them. Seeing as it is spooky season, strange things happen, I don't know, Mercury's in retrograde, there's a full moon out, your best friend might be a werewolf, all that stuff leads me to think that this is the perfect episode to get a little meta, to start taking things in an inward direction so we look at the podcast medium from a different perspective, and that is entirely what we're going to do. On today's show, I'm lucky enough to have Mariana Ruiz of the Impact Driven Entrepreneur podcast and Matt Hartman from A Drunkard's Walk, a podcast about Wikipedia, and we're going to spend some time just talking about the medium, talking about getting going. For anybody who's interested in some behind-the-scenes perspective, this is going to be golden. For anybody who's interested interested in starting their own podcast, putting their voice out there. This should hopefully help you feel empowered and just ready to go to send your message out there in whatever sort of manner you want in the podcasting space. So without further ado, let's talk about podcasting. Mariana and Matt, thanks so much for joining. Uh, I wanted to start this show off with a throwback to the shows that you guys do. Um, and uh, Matt, I'm going to start with you. Uh, what are you drinking during this podcast? <laughs> well, I, uh, you know, <laughs> that's so uh, for those that don't listen to the Drunkard's Walk, we do occasionally have a, a drink as we as we do our podcast. Uh, I I did not uh, bring. Well, I actually do have a drink with me. It's just a uh, vitamin water, though, this time. Um, but uh, yeah, so we will we will occasionally do a. Uh, uh, I, I had bourbons. That's basically what I'm drinking most of the time. Um, and uh, but uh, not every episode. To be clear, we we don't we don't drink on every episode of Drunkard's Walk, which um, I can explain. I can explain that later. Yeah, we'll get there. So, uh, important question about your vitamin water. Do you identify your vitamin waters based off of flavor or color? Uh, flavor, I guess, because there's many of them that are the same color. So, so generally flavor, or I, I mean, sometimes by the title, like I'll actually pay attention to the title as well. You're a step ahead of me. I feel like it's always like, uh, pink. I'll go pink today. Uh, Mariana, do you have a beverage of the episode? It's plain old water. Awesome. Uh, and then Mariana, my question for you was, uh, you know, I as I listened to a bunch of interviews that you did, um, one of my favorite questions you always ask people is like uh, regarding your entrepreneurial business, like, you know, what did you expect when you stepped into this? So uh, you're now on a podcast about podcasting. Like, what did you expect when you stepped into this uh, this episode today? Total inception. It's going to be inception episode. <laughs> but yeah. Um, I think we're going to have a good time. And I'm sorry if you hear my little 10 pound dog walking around. She is 12 and just can't help herself. I'm assuming the audience would lo also love to know her name if you don't mind sharing it. Nala from The Lion King. Mm. <laughs> All right, perfect. We've got Mariana and Nala beaming in. And Matt, how about you? What did you expect from this when you uh, when you signed up? Uh, well, I, I do have a, a top spinning uh, next to me here just to make sure uh, if I needed a kick. Um, but uh, no, I, I, I didn't I didn't really know a lot what to expect. Actually, I just um, just was having uh, dinner with my family and uh, I was like, OK, well, I have to go record this podcast. Um, and they were like, what what is it? And I said, I not 100 percent certain. I know we're going to be talking about podcasts. And my daughter said, you're going to do a podcast about podcasts. And I said, yes. And she was like. Oh, <laughs> so, so yeah, so, uh, we don't, I, I don't really know. I don't really know what to expect. All right. That's good. We, uh, you know, we're burying the lead, I suppose. Uh, so Mariana, I, I'm going to start, uh, with you if you don't mind. So you, uh, started off your career in nursing. Um, 
And uh, at one point, I guess you you worked with uh, like organ administration. Um, and I'm really curious, but what as a, you know, as a, a young person, we're all young people on this show, like what made you a younger young person? Uh, what made you decide that like nursing and sort of helping and assisting people was the type of career you wanted to follow? Yeah, so I went to school. Um, I got my first degree in psychology. I just loved everything about the brain. I knew that mental health and mental illness was not exactly where I wanted to be because I really enjoy the brain, like neurology, and I love positive psychology, but I'm young, but not that young. At that time, the field of positive psychology didn't really exist as it does today. So I um, got a degree in nursing because I was able to start working right away, you know, get a good career going. And my first job was in brain surgery, which is exactly what I wanted to be in. And um, then from there, I went to organ transplant coordination. And I love that very fulfilling, but it's 24 hour shifts. So once I had kids, that was no longer like something I could do. So I went into hospital administration and um, case management at that time. And then essentially, I mean, I had one baby and I started a little coaching business. I was like, you know what? I can help people with health and like prevention and like staying healthy. And so I I was doing that. Um, I got pregnant and had my daughter who was um, 60 or 20 eight weeks gestation. And she was in the hospital for over 68 days, had to have open heart surgery. Therefore I could not return back to my career in uh, hospital administration, but I was leaning heavily on this little side business, this little coaching business. And I was from the NICU like waiting room, just doing my website, getting things up and running, running challenges, (laughs) Um, and I grew that company to a pretty substantial level. And people started asking me like, what are you doing? How are you able to stay home with your kids and like make all of this work? And that's really when I started shifting into more business coaching and that type of thing. And then I ran that company for seven years until I closed it last year. Um, so I, I mean, and it was a pretty substantial, I mean, we were doing multiple six figures and I had nine employees. So it was a, it was a pretty decent company and gig. It's just, I got a little bit burnt out and, um, I wasn't able to scale it and cut, like come away from being the face of the business. That was one of my biggest obstacles with scaling. Um, I didn't want to be the face of the business anymore. I wanted to just like go on vacation and never post on social media or do anything of that nature. And so that became really difficult for me. And um, I went back to my career in ner- in um, hospital administration, and I've been doing that ever since. Um, I have ideas of things I want to do. We're kind of getting stuff in the works of things we want to do. But ultimately, um, I I would like a business where it can scale and grow and me not be the center of it. Um, especially as you know, I have young kids. I don't, I don't want them seeing me everywhere <laughs> at this point. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. And this is this is more just for my own curiosity. But like, what, where did that little spark of uh, you know, uh, starting the coaching business side hustle come from? Like, uh, you obviously had a really successful career in in health management, and then kind of just shifted this thing along the side. Like, what what was the gestation of that like? Okay. So I have been an entrepreneur since I can remember. Like when I was like seven, I moved to the U S from Venezuela. Um, and I, we lived in university housing, like my best friend and I literally started a, a business quote unquote, like collecting cans. We were like university housing. You get cans back for five cents. This is amazing. The U S is the best. And so we started like going around, buying the cans from all the university students, returning them for profit. Like we, it's just been in my blood ever since. And when I had, uh, when I was 23, I bought my first rental property. Like it just is something in me that has never stopped. So when I saw the opportunity for coaching online, I was like, I have to get on this. Like, it's just, I couldn't see it and not see it. You know, once you're an entrepreneur like that, it just is in your blood. So uh, 
when I when I saw it, I had to jump on it. Essentially, that's awesome. Uh, and then and then Matt, you uh, you've had a really awesome career in in STEM. You know, kind of doing uh, you know project development, uh, and and uh, you were a teacher for a little while, if I understand correctly. Um, and now you're working as a game designer. Like, what what was sort of your professional journey to to find uh, a STEM career? Well, first of all, Ryan, you've done your research quite well. Uh, excellent, excellent job. Um, so yeah, no, I started uh, uh, in education. Um, I mean, I, I I started getting involved in education even before college. I would do um, volunteer work at the Carnegie Science Center here in Pittsburgh. Um, and I really just, I knew that being a science teacher was kind of what I wanted to do. Um, so I worked at summer camps as counselors. I did all that kind of stuff and then uh, went to school and got a degree in secondary ed and focused in science, general science and earth and space science. Um, and went on to uh, eventually, a couple years out of college, become a teacher at a very small private school in the Washington DC area. Um, and it was a great school. It's called the GW Community School. Uh, it's right outside of DC. It and it had sixty students in grades nine through twelve, so very very small. I had class sizes of anywhere from like one to ten, and that was it. You know, so it was it was amazing. I loved it. Um, I had great experiences there teaching not just science, but also I got to teach theater and phys ed and filmmaking and uh, game design and. Um, algebra and, uh, you know, a whole bunch of different subjects. Um, and uh, I loved it right up until the point that I couldn't afford my apartment anymore. Uh, and then I had to find a different path. So um, fortunately for me, the National Science Teaching Association is based in Arlington, Virginia, which is right where I was living. And I applied there for a job as a course developer, uh, was lucky enough to get that. It uh, That job was eliminated a year in unfortunately. And then I moved over to a project called eCyber Mission, which is a STEM competition for middle school students, grades six to nine, uh, so middle and a little bit of high school, um, sponsored by the US Army, but run by NSTA. And uh, I worked on that as like kind of the content manager for about 11 years um, and really enjoyed that as well. Uh, it was a great place to work and it was a really fun experience. And I wasn't in the classroom anymore. And I, I miss that. I still miss that. I still miss not actually teaching day to day, but I did still get to interact with teachers. I got to interact with uh, students at our national event. Um, I got to give workshops and do professional development for teachers, which I really enjoyed. Um, and then, uh, uh, you know, it had been 11 years and I was kind of like, let's see what else is around. Um, I got a position at Brain Pop, which is like a, uh, educational tech company and they they were just developing their new science product um so i got to work on that for about six months that position was eliminated <laughs> and uh it's not me i swear i think anyway i don't know um but fortunately right around that same time a friend of mine from uh a group that i do the mit puzzle hunt with every year uh was looking for somebody with a background in general knowledge trivia and improv and so these are things that I did in my spare time. Uh, I ran a trivia night for about three years during the pandemic. Um, I did uh, I did improv since 2002. Um, really enjoy that. And so I was like, hey, I, I am built for your job. I'll do it. So it turns out that he was looking for somebody to join their game development team uh, on this new game that is not out yet. Um, so I can't talk too much about it because I, I signed an NDA. But... Um, it is it'll be out in the next year or so and uh it's essentially a guessing game um and so i generate a lot of the content and curate the content and film videos and clues and and all sorts of things like that so i'm a game developer like that's my official title but like to call me that is an insult to every other game developer in the world because they all know what they're doing when it comes to computers and i don't like i I did a little bit of programming on my Atari 800 when I was a kid. I could program in basic and I think logo when I was in, um, you know, on my Apple IIe at, at school and I used pilot and I, my, uh, my TI 83 calculator, I could, you know, do some programming in there, but really I don't know design very well. I just know the content and I just know the pop culture stuff and things like that. So that's the reason that I had got my job that I, uh, that I just absolutely adore and, um, yeah, I'm really excited about it, but uh, it was a weird it was a weird path in for sure. 
Well, I say give yourself more credit as a game designer. In this room right here, you are the lead game designer that we have. <laughs> so, oh, wow. Um, right. Okay. And, that's true. Uh, you know, that's in true. the I'm, I'm beaming in from my office right here, but down the hall, one of my colleagues teaches game design uh, and does it exclusively with board games. So, uh, oh, okay. you know, there's a there's there's that way where the understanding the foundation of these things then plays into the uh, the technological component. Um, yeah, you know, that's it's just true. Sort of and, the nature of the beast. And as I said, I did teach a game design class uh, one year at this high school that I taught at, but it was it was board game, board and card games. Uh, and it was because I loved I love board games and card games. And so we talked about like, why are they themed this way and what makes it fun? And, you know, what's the difference between the Star Wars Escape from the Death Star board game from 1977 and Settlers of Catan? Like, why are these different? So, yeah, I, I know a little bit about that aspect of it. Um, which is great, but uh, yeah, so it's fun. It's fun. Right. It's a good time. I'm dubbing you at least a level three game designer at this point. <laughs> okay. Oh, thank um, you. No problem. So the other thing, and before we jump into podcasts, and I, I just have to ask this, is that you also have an 18-year history uh, in voiceover. Uh, in our last episode, we had Mark Silk, so apparently there's a there's a voiceover theme going on. But as I was looking at your client list, where you've got Hershey Park, you've got Veteran Affairs, you did stuff for Sheets, which I know there was the whole Sheets Wawa debate. That's probably the controversial job right there, Matt. Um, <laughs> what what was your interest in in voice acting? Obviously, well before you were you were podcasting. Uh, so I, I mean, I've been acting and performing since I was in elementary school. I, I did the wizard of Oz and was the scarecrow in fifth grade and I was hooked. Um, so I just always have loved performing. And when I found out that there was a way to make money as a performer, standing behind a microphone for 30 minutes and getting paid as though I had done like five days of work, I was like, yes, I would love to be a part of that. Um, so I've been fortunate enough here in Pittsburgh. I'm represented by um, the Doherty casting group and um, and they they're fantastic. So I get, you know, auditions all the time and I, I put myself out for them. I don't book a ton of them, but occasionally here and there I do. And um, and as far as the Wawa Sheets debate goes, when it comes to voiceover, I'll do voiceover for whoever pays me. I, I'm not going to be picky on that type of thing. Uh, but I'll probably eat at Sheets just because there's more of them in the area where I am. There's no there's no Wawa's nearby. But I, I like Wawa just fine. It was a that was a very political answer. Nice yeah, nice job. Right. Uh, I don't. I, I, all of a sudden, I don't know. Some other gas station will come in and be like, we, "We're going to throw a wrench in this whole equation." Yeah, it's uh, Bucky's, right? They're the one that's coming from the south, and they're starting to infiltrate the north. Uh, so watch out for Bucky's. I will say they've got the best logo of the three. Mm -hmm. You know, it's adorable. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. So uh, actually getting back to to sort of this this meta inception thing, uh, Mariana, you you started, if I understand correctly, you started uh, your coaching business in 2014 um, and then scaled up, scaled up, scaled up, and then eventually added podcasting as sort of part of your brand and part of your, I, I don't know how I want to say this, like package. I mean, it was it's a part of what you do. It's a marketing tool. Can you tell us a little bit about how you eventually started this this podcast in 2016? Yeah. So, um, I, well, I felt like I wanted a place where I could give like deep content that was like something really, really valuable for people and that I could refer back to. So it actually became this like great vault that we would use on sales calls. My sales team would then like give different episodes to different people based on what they were struggling with. Um, so it just became this, like, I wanted a library of, of something valuable that people could refer back to, and it could really stand the test of time. And I found that podcasting lended itself to that at that time in 2016. I mean, I was doing a blog like 2014, 2015. And at that time, blogs were like the thing. So adding this different um, element of audio really brought things to life and like a deeper connection with people. Um, and initially I did interview style and I got some pretty big names on the show initially, which got like the momentum going really nicely. Um, but I think the, the biggest value of the entire thing, like I said, was that library that was built of evergreen content that people could then just refer to over and over and over again. Yeah. And your publishing schedule was awesome. I One little factoid that I want to throw out there, which is you talked about starting off with a blog, is I think a lot of people don't realize that the, um, how do I say this, the 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 through line between blogs and podcasts is is pretty straight, 
where blogs came out and one of the pieces of technology that was that was invented for them was the RSS feed where people could go and they could subscribe and have that content come to them. And then all of a sudden, Apple Podcast is like, let's do that for audio. Um, and the RSS feed becomes available for, for audio content. And that's kind of the birth of the podcast. And they, you know, those two technologies, here's one way to communicate my idea via text. Here's a way that I can communicate it via via audio and people can listened in their cars, you know, completely changed the game, but it's the same infrastructure, which I think is pretty cool. Um, but you had, you know, but so you did it between 2016 and 2022 and you had 318 episodes. <laughs> I mean, that's a <laughs> lot of content. And I appreciated the fact that like when I was going through and kind of looking at what you were doing, um, you didn't lock yourself into one format. As you mentioned, you know, you started off with this is a podcast where I'll interview people. And then as the podcast continues, I'm going to do a six minute episode where I just talk about this one topic that I think my audience needs to hear. Um, how did you, you know, how did you determine publishing schedule? How did you determine what the the validity of your content needed to be? Oh my gosh. Okay. So lots of trial and error. Okay. Like I said, I'm an entrepreneur. You know what's great? You just do it, you fail a lot, you learn from it, and then you just tweak. I mean, that that was essentially what I did. And just getting those reps in um, was key, especially in the beginning. So in the beginning, I started with a format of seasons because I was afraid that I wasn't going to be able to stay consistent every week. That was a huge fear of mine. And I know like when I was initially searching podcasts at that time, people were saying, okay, most podcasts don't last beyond like three or four episodes. So, and I was nervous about committing to this show, you know, it just felt so big. So I said, I'm going to do a season and then I'm going to do a certain number, whatever it was, it was like eight or 10 or whatever it was per that season. And then I would see how I felt after, you know, how did this affect how I was feeling, how people were receiving the information, you know, was there any growth in sales in in the business at all? Um, and so that's kind of how I I started. And then eventually, when I felt more comfortable, I said, you know what, I can just publish once a week, every week. And we eventually went to that. Um, and then in terms of whether it was interviews or solo, it the content was mostly generated by questions that my audience was going through, things I was seeing on sales calls or in coaching sessions with my clients. Um, it was really just a response, which made it so much easier and simpler for me to create and stay consistent. I was just, you know, like, kind of like when you asked me initially, like you went from this helping people, I just kept doing that. You know, I just kept, what do they need? Where are they stuck? What can I do to help? And whether that was bringing people on specialists or myself just getting on for five minutes. Um, sometimes it was Facebook lives that we then repurposed into podcast episodes, which was a little tough on the production <laughs> side for my team to do, but it was worth it. Um, so that's kind of how I ran it. Awesome. And then uh, you kind of alluded to this, but when you started, did you have a specific audience in mind? Like, were you thinking specifically about these are people that are in the program or are thinking about kind of using me as a coach? Or were you thinking even more global than that, that you wanted, you wanted to be able to use it as a way to get the word out about you? No, it was definitely towards an audience. So I would just use my ideal client, which um, initially, like I said, when I shifted into business coaching, it was mothers who wanted to, to be able to stay home with their kids and run a business. So that's who I initially targeted. And then over time, I was getting non-mothers and like some men and stuff. And I was like, I need to like rebrand this so that it's like more... Um, in line with like the audience that I'm actually attracting. So that rebrand happened much later. Awesome. And I think there was a, one of the things I kind of appreciated about it too, is that there's kind of an empowerment of being in the program and being a success story and, you know, like being able to share your story and knowing that like, oh, someday I could be on the podcast. I thought it was kind of cool. I listened to, was was a woman who had her PhD in biology and then was trying to figure out what her career could turn into. Uh, and, you know, like was over the moon to share her experience with people. And obviously was over the moon to sort of be a part of this podcasting medium. 
Yes. Yeah. Our, some of our best episodes were our clients um, and featuring their, their stories and what they went through, but you're right. It was um, kind of like a big in the program. It was like really warrant, like um, a merit basically to get on the show because you had to have success to get on. (laughs) So awesome. And then, and then Matt, you, uh, you started the, if I understand correctly, so you started the Drunkards Walk podcast with uh, Jethro Nolan, another fellow uh, improv specialist uh, in 2021 um, and have been going for almost a hundred episodes with eight seasons, which is pretty great, uh, including such guests as chat GPT, uh, which, which made it, made it on what's the sort of origin story of the drunkards walk. And, and I should actually clarify, what is the drunkards walk? Can you give a little, <laughs> uh, a little overview on that? Yeah. So um, I mean, we, I, we actually started back in 2020 um and um it it was a um it was it was a pandemic project um but uh we had been talking about it before that um essentially we looked at the market and we said there are not enough podcasts uh out there uh we need we need more podcasts and so we decided that that was the 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 best place to to enter and we thought we want to do something that takes time and is creative and can it cannot make any money at all um, and, and it was perfect. It was a perfect fit for us. So um, that was what we decided on doing. And uh, when when Jethro and I talked, so Jethro is, as you say, uh, we're we are improvisers. Um, we both performed at the Arcade Comedy Theater. That's where I met Jethro um, back in 2013. And um, I got to know him over that time. And really, I mean, he is he is one of the finest performers I've ever performed with. Um, he, he's a fantastic improviser. He's very, very funny. He's never going to hear this, is he? Uh, I don't. I don't know. We can try to block him. The internet okay. can't get okay, around, good. right? Because if he finds out that I'm saying all this, it'll go straight to his head. Um, but uh, but it just an uh, incredibly talented guy, and um, I I was I was lucky enough that he uh, also felt that I was talented enough to to want to continue to do projects with as well. So um, I suggested this idea of a podcast. We discussed it a little bit, and essentially what it came down to was we wanted to try to come up with a, an idea that would take the smallest amount of prep possible. And that's that's one of the things that improvisers uh, generally love is that we can um you know uh do do the do the hard work and the learning how to do this and then not have that sort of week to week prep quite as much as you would on a scripted show or something along those lines. Um and so we came up with this idea for Drunkard's Walk uh which was named is named after a mathematical principle. Uh the idea being that if you start at one particular point and you go and make random turns, uh, you will eventually wind up back at the point you started at. That's the that's the principle behind a drunkard's walk, which I had never heard of before. Uh, Jethro came up with the title, and what we do is we get a random topic on Wikipedia, just a random Wikipedia page, and we then use the links that are on the pages to try to get to another Wikipedia page that is another random thing that is not related to our first page. Um, And that's it. And so we started that by, uh, we would go on Facebook and we would post and say, hey, give us ideas for pages that we can start at and end at. Um, Well, actually, I guess just end at, because what we did, we started with Drunkard's Walk. There's an actual Wikipedia page for Drunkard's Walk or Random Walk. That was our very first starting page for uh, season one, episode one. And then we got a, a destination, as we call it, our ending page. And then the next episode, we would start wherever we ended and get a new destination. So we started off by doing that through Facebook. We would, uh, we would, you know, start recording the episode, we would post on Facebook, and we would just wait, and <laughs> we would just chat. And then somebody would post and we'd be, oh, there they go. Okay, well, this is where we're going to go. Um, we discovered after about a season of that, that uh, just listening to us is okay but not great and uh we wanted to bring other voices on so we started uh getting people to give us their suggestions beforehand and now we bring them on as our guest at the top of each episode and then they are on they talk to us a bit and then usually they will drop off the call and then we will go on the walk uh to try to get from from one place to the other and and as we mentioned before we do occasionally have a drink as well because it's called drunkard's walk so we thought eh, it's a not a terrible uh, reason to have a to have a drink in the evening, and um, 
and we've, we've introduced some things here and there. Like, uh, we, we both predict how many steps it will take us to get to the, the next page. And then the winner of that episode gets a, gets a win. And at the end of the season, whoever has the most wins usually has to uh, usually win something from the other person. Um, uh, I say the person, it's always Jethro. He always went every season. He has won except for one season where we tied and then we carried it over to the next season. And then he won that one. Um, but usually we, you know, like a bottle of, uh, a, a, a bourbon or, or I think we've done steaks before and things like that. Um, but yeah, so it's just, it, we wanted to have fun and we wanted something that wasn't going to be a ton of work. Um, fortunately this is not, we don't do a lot of editing to our episodes. We just, we start them, we talk, and then when it's done, I, I usually take them, I will master them a little bit um, just so the, the levels are all correct. And if there's like coughs or things like that, or if there's a problem, tech problem, we'll cut that out. But otherwise, the, the episodes are, are pretty raw. Um, and uh, we have, you know, we have our, uh, what do you call them? Uh, the, what's the, what do you call the, the company that, that posts for you? Not posts for you, but you know what I'm talking about? Like where you store them all. Oh, like Lips your host? Or, yeah, your host. Yeah, yeah the yeah, host. Yeah. yeah, okay. So yeah. there you go. So we use uh, we use Buzzsprout for that. And, um, you know, we go, we post them up, and they get posted to all the different uh, platforms. And, um, you know, people listen. Not a lot of people, but enough that we're kind of, that we're having fun doing it. And, um, yeah, we have, uh, we have a super fan, Dave Foreman, who was on your show uh, just a couple episodes ago, or I, I guess well a few episodes ago now yep um and uh he's he's great he's a huge supporter of the show he's been on a number of our episodes uh he's done full walks with us as well because um when you when you're a, when you're a patron at a particular level which he has been uh you get to walk the whole walk with us um and uh we've had some other supporters we just had on um a local celebrity in Pittsburgh Rick Seaback He's he's one of our favorite people in the world, and uh, he was nice enough to come on and do the show for us. So, um, you know, we, we just like it. We like talking to each other. We we get our friends on. We get to talk to them, and uh, it's just fun. It's just a fun time. That's awesome. And I really uh, just one comment about the show is that I find it interesting that it's got it's it's the backbone of the show is built on some knowledge of improv. Um, Sort of, you know, I mean, you've got, you've got Dave, you've got, you, you've got Jethro who all have this background in improv, but it's not something that is an overcurrent. Like if somebody is just sort of listening to the show, they're not necessarily going to understand that a lot of the banter back and forth is, is our, like, literally, I think the episode I was listening today was like, at one point, someone's like, is this a bit? I can't tell if we're having a bit <laughs> or not. Um but I think that's just really important about the way in which, like, I think the beauty of some pieces of art that anybody makes is understanding what your skill sets are and how to repackage them. Um, and I think that the show does a really nice job with that. Uh, the other thing is that uh, you guys both have kind of brought up one of the topics that I think is really important whenever it comes to sort of developing content, period, but especially developing digital content, which is we we often think of as a kind of ephemeral, but the idea of sustainability and the idea that like there has to be something built into the way in which you do your work that makes it so you can come back to it. It hopefully doesn't feel like a job, but if it does feel like a job, you you're scheduling in breaks and, and kind of going from there. So Mariana, I want to flip it back to you. When you were putting this together, uh, what was, if, if, if you're comfortable answering this question, at, as this was sort of wrapped into the business that you were doing, um, did you start this project off with a team to sort of help it uh, incubate and grow? Or was this something that you started entirely on your own and then wrapped into the business? Okay. So I am a perfectionist. And um, so initially I was like, I'm going to do these episodes by myself. And my perfectionism really kicked in. That meant I was editing episodes, like a 30 minute episode for like eight hours. Like it was really bad. And so, you know, my biggest trick to overcoming all my humanness is always delegation. So <laughs> that's pretty much how I do it. So if I'm really struggling, I'm like, okay, I need help and I need someone to help me with this. So that's what I did. I I started, I think it was like the first, so I released with, I think, four episodes and I try to edit all those. And I was like, this is a complete failure in my eyes because I cannot invest eight hours per episode to publish this. 
and you know the re-recording because nobody else was going to hold me accountable to not re-recording 10 times so <laughs> um so that's kind of what I what I did I did the first four by myself and then after that I was like I need help and I I got a podcast editor right away and they helped me the rest of the show everything else was done by other people um including I mean, even at the end of the show, all of the promotion for it, every single piece of repurposing content, all the social media posts, every single thing was done not by me. I I got to the point where I could be like more like your show and just show up and record. And then everything else was taken care of by somebody else. But that for me was the big part of how it became sustainable because my brain is very perfectionistic and was just going to block me at every point. (laughs) So... Well, kudos to you for battling perfectionism for 314 <laughs> episodes. That's awesome. Yeah. I, and people. If, it's all it, other people, though. You and know, how, like, how did you hunt down somebody who would edit your podcast? Like, what, what channels did you go through to find that type of uh, talent? Okay, so I think the first one I did was probably like Fiverr or something like that. And then eventually um, I hired like internal teams like internal people to do that because they were also doing all the social media posts and everything else. So I hired VAs basically. Um, but all, almost all my VAs that uh, at least the ones that did podcast editing were all overseas. So, yeah. That's awesome. And then uh, Matt, how about you? How do you, um, are, are you guys an army of two? Is there any other people that sort of help out with the project? Um, so for the most part we are, uh, I will say that our theme music was written by Jesse Ali, uh, another friend of ours, another improviser, a brilliant musician. Um, so we, we went to him and said, Hey, we are, we need a theme for our podcast and we'd like to pay you to write a theme that we can use in perpetuity. And he was like, great. And he gave us a couple options and, uh, did just did an amazing job with it. I really like our theme. Um, and then our artwork, uh, was done by a gentleman named Nick Harmio, another improviser that we both know and are friends with. And, um, you know, we, we were like, Hey, we want to commission you to, to create uh, some art for us for this, uh, for this podcast. And so he did, so he designed our logo and everything like that. But since then, um, yeah, it's essentially, we, we get on, uh, I, I do most of the administrative stuff for it. Uh, so I do the, um, the scheduling and the recording, um, and the editing and, uh, social media posts and, you know, putting it on the, the host and everything along those lines. Um, and not, not like, and I, I'm not saying that to be like, and Jethro doesn't pull his weight at all. Like I essentially said to Jethro, look, I'm interested in doing this. And I'm interested in putting the time in that it will, that will be required for this. If you are interested in being a part of, you know, the, uh, the rest of this. And, and he, he definitely, I mean, it's not like he does nothing. He's on the show and he is, um, he, he actually got us some really nice, uh, tumblers, like these etched tumblers, which are these beautiful, like, that's what we, that's what we drink out of. But like he investigated all that and did, um, you know, anyway, so he, uh, he still does stuff with it as well, but I do a lot of the the kind of day to day just because, like I said, I I told him that I'd like to do it, and so I'll do it. Um, because I am a little, I'm a little bit of a perfectionist too, but I'm a perfectionist who's not very good at a lot of things, so I'm okay if it's not perfect. So I'm not sure that makes me a perfectionist, but I definitely am a control freak. That's better. I want to control everything. Um, so <laughs> when when you know, it's like, yeah, I'll do all this because then I can decide how this is going to be and you know what's the format going to be and stuff like that there are some episodes where one season i decided to put fake commercials at the end of every episode just because i was like this will be fun and so i just recorded these little fake commercials at the end of every episode yeah okay um you know jethro didn't care um but i've done a couple of other i've started to work on a couple of other projects and i've said to the people listen i am happy to do this i would love to be part of the creative team here, but I, I cannot take on another, like, I'm not going to do the editing. I'm not going to do the posting. I'm not going to do all that stuff for this. So if you're okay doing that, let's do it. Let's, let's make this thing happen. Um, and so, uh, right now drunkards walk is the only podcast you can listen to that I'm on. So <laughs> that's, you know, that's kind of, that's, that's just, that's the nature of the beast, I think. 
Well, I think, uh, well, two, two things. One is that, uh, you know, you've done a good job of uh, pumping up Jethro and then uh, totally beating him down. So I think that at this point, uh, it's evened itself out. Um, and number two is that I do think that with, especially with podcasting, people, I don't know if people just choose to think that there's barriers to entry for this medium um, or if it's just, it seems like it's too much work or they just like, I don't know. They, it's something they just don't want to investigate. But in my experience, when you tell people like, oh, I'm doing a podcast or things like that, the first words out of people's mouths is typically congratulations. And I'm like, well, thanks, I guess. But this is something that I'm doing for me. It's something that I'm really excited about. Um, and then when you sort of invite people on board and you say, you know, like, hey, would you be interested in helping with a logo design? Would you be interested in being a guest on the podcast? I think people tend to be excited about that, even if it's labor, even if it's, you know, hey, are you interested in helping to edit this? I'll give you a, you know, I'll we can call you the audio engineer. Um, and usually that will sort of lead to a, a, a positive collaboration because people want to be a part of something cool, um, yeah. which I think is kind of important. Um, Mariana, when you were, when you were doing the podcast from, you know, I just 318 episodes, just so much content. <laughs> um, but how, what did, what did the sort of like lead ups and, and not necessarily day to day, but like, what did the background look like? How often were you, you know, if you recorded an episode, what was the turnaround time between recording and publishing and, you know, making sh like, what were the sort of inherent either definitive deadlines or artificial deadlines that you created to to make this thing happen like how what type of work was happening in the background and what was the uh, the way in which it would unravel okay so um from my blogging days i just kind of started with that same format which was um when i ran the blog i said i'm going to publish on i can't remember i think it was on wednesdays but whatever it was it was like wednesdays by 9 or whatever the deadline was. And so everything had to be done by Wednesday at nine. So what, it was an artificial deadline. However, I had publicized it to like my audience. So then I felt very responsible to the deadline. <laughs> so that was the primary driver. Um, and then for the, for the podcast, we just did the same thing. I think I started with one episode a week. And then there were weeks where I would do more than one episode a week for a, a, a stint of time. And um, in the background, basically, I would take one day a month to brainstorm what I would talk about for the month and just kind of what my topics would be. And then really at some point before, like usually the weekend, um, I would prep the prep the content, like, what am I going to get in depth here on, you know, what am I seeing? What are the trends? What are the questions people are asking me regarding this topic? And then um, I would make the outline record, and then my team would um, make it all pretty and, and do it for me by the deadline. Um, so that was pretty much the workflow. Um, and, you know, during this time, like, I, I mentioned, like, my life, right? So I had a preemie daughter initially, and she came home on breathing monitors. So like, I was taking care of her, I had two kids under two, I had no nanny, and my ex husband was working all the time. I also said ex husband. So I went through a divorce in the middle of this, like, I went through so much life. <laughs> and I honestly, without my team, I would not have been able to do that. Like, I would not have been able to do over 300 episodes if it weren't for the people that I had around me to be like we are doing this we're getting this out there we're here to help people you know what I mean My, that mission of like continuing to help people and the mission of um of and the people around me that I had to support me were the only reason that, that I was able to do that so I just want to point that out because you know life happens like so much you know and you just don't know what you're going to run into. Um, but if you set yourself up and have accountability, like I, I think about you having like a co-host, that's another way of doing accountability, right? Like if, if things get hard, you have somebody else, you know, to hold you accountable. So that's kind of how I looked at it. I love it. And I think that like, 
I'm, I'm going to like recently Bob Barker passed away. Right. So like when people think about watching The Price is Right, they think like, oh, every day when I'm homesick eating chicken soup, I'm going to watch The Price is Right and they're filming it live and blah, blah, blah. And then you peel back the curtain and you realize like, oh, they filmed all those episodes over the course of like a day or two um, mm-hmm. all at once. And then they come out and there's the illusion that this is this live thing. Um, I think that's one thing part of the creative process that people need to just like take a deep breath and accept like it's okay like I love the fact that you spend one day just saying for the next 30 these are all the topics I'm going to carry over and I think that when you do that type of planning spending two hours just making notes all of a sudden you you have an obscene amount of content that you can handle because it's there it just needs time to to sort of manifest itself and come out uh sorry no, that's it. I said okay. yes. <laughs> Yay. Uh, Matt, for you, what does the what is the background of Drunkard's Walk look like? How do you guys, you know, do your do your recording schedules? Uh, well, one of the things I one of the important things that we learned uh, pretty early on was that we had to have um, a bunch of episodes recorded, like you say, before we started releasing them. Uh, specifically because life happens as, as, as you said, Mariana, like things come up and you're expecting, we, our normal schedule is we record once a week. Um, so we would record in the evenings, um, Jethro lives in Michigan. I live in Pennsylvania. So we record via zoom exclusively. We've never been in the same place when we were recording. Um, and so we just always record on zoom, uh, much like we're doing today and uh, so yeah, we set that up for once a week and we schedule our guests. Sometimes we have guests scheduled weeks in advance. Other times we schedule the guests the day before or the day of, sometimes we are scrambling because we're like, and, and to, to add to, you asked before if, if there's anybody else that works on this, uh, I have to say thank you to every single guest we've ever had, because without those people we don't have episodes. And sometimes it has been, they have saved us at the last minute because we've just been like one guest has had to back out or we haven't been able to find anybody else. And I go to my wife and I'm like, Hey, want to be on another episode of the podcast? And she's like, yeah, sure. Okay. You know, she doesn't, she doesn't, uh, even hesitate. Um, so, uh, that has been really helpful that we have so many people that are supportive of us, um, in what we're doing in this thing that is just, I mean, it's for fun. It's for fun for us. Um, and and people seem to like to listen to it from time to time as well, the people who are on it. But um, you know, not always. I talked to my friends and I was like, "So yeah, you ever listen to the podcast?" And they're like, "No." I'm like, okay, cool, cool, thanks, man. Um, but yeah, it's a it's a weekly thing. We record once a week. Um, usually, then the we would record like on a Wednesday or a Thursday. We release on Tuesdays, um, but we're always releasing episodes that are well ahead of where we've recorded. So very rarely were we releasing the episode we just recorded like the next week, although it has happened because things have gotten pushed back from time to time. Um, so usually the weekend before the, uh, the release of an episode, I'll like spend an hour on Saturday, you know, going through fixing it up, you know, uh, changing the formats and mastering it and getting it wherever I need it to be. Um, Oh yeah. And then, uh, and then, you know, have it set up to to release at, um, I think we release at like 4 a.m. on Tuesday or something like that usually, um, because then that way it's out before people go to work if they want to listen to it in the car or something like that. I don't know how people listen to our podcast. I don't even know who listens to our podcast. Uh, I see the number of downloads that we get, and sometimes it goes way higher. We had, we had one episode that was, um, we started titling our episodes with the name of where we were starting. So it's like, you know, um, the, what, whatever the thing might be, uh, ball lightning two, and then question mark, right? That's our, that's how we title the episodes. So one of our episodes ended at postmodern jukebox. And so the next episode was titled postmodern jukebox two question mark. That episode got more downloads by, by a magnitude of a thousand than any of our others, because, uh, it was on. I think it was Pandora or one of the one of the like music streaming services. And clearly people were searching for postmodern jukebox. Our episode was popping up and they were clicking on it and downloading it. And then they started to listen to it and went, What is this? This is <laughs> this is not postmodern jukebox. This is these two idiots talking. And so uh, but it it like 
it was in our season two though. So we took season one and season two down. We put them behind the paywall for our patrons because we needed to have something to give people who were going to give us money. Um, and uh, so it stopped getting downloads, but it was it was ridiculous, like the number of and we like I, I reached out to the person who was the guest on that show. I was like, look at how many people are listening. You must have a lot of friends. And she was like, no, I don't. I've not talked to anyone who's listened to it. And I was like, OK, cool. It's also good. That's also good to hear. That's awesome. Yeah, it's funny. Uh, right before uh, you guys logged in, I, I was looking at the the statistics from uh, the episode that I published uh, last week. And, you know, usually when I check, it's like kind of an inconsequential amount or you have the inevitable like doom scrolling. There's been no downloads since you last checked and you're like, oh, I guess I'm going to go eat a tub of ice cream. Um, but as I was looking at it, like it went up by 50 percent since I last checked and I had checked like earlier today. I have no idea where the word got out on this thing. I'm not sure if it's a, a social media post that like finally got approved in a forum that I put out there or if the guest had posted it somewhere else or whatever. But like, I, uh, you know, not that these not that these things are like a bunch of smoke and mirrors. I mean, there's there's a lot of importance to the intentionality of advertising, um, but there are times where like the internet catches hold of things and you you can't quite figure out how that synthesized. Um, and it's, I don't know, it's, it's like kind of fun miracle. And the other thing, and this is, I, I try to be really positive on the show and I, I'm not, I don't think I'm being a downer with this, but I do think it's an important realization is, uh, you know, Matt, you talked about the fact that like, oh, I have this new episode out and I asked my friends like, oh, have you listened? No, I, I know you do a podcast, but I've never listened to it. And I, I don't think that's a bad thing. I just think it's an important, Mariana, I hope you you probably agree with this in the world of entrepreneurship. Like so many people, when I talk to them about starting businesses, starting creative projects or whatever, their first thought is that their audience is their friends. It's the people that they're with mm -hmm. all the time. And as soon as you come out with the content, you very quickly realize that that was a bad decision and that it's not that they don't support you. It's that they support you in everything and that they can't get, devote the time that you're, you know, I guess a thousand true fans, if we're going to use that sort of economic model would have. Like, do you guys have any sort of feelings on that about, you know, uh, creating who you create the content for and the way in which you think about your friend base and, and go from there, Mariana? Yeah, I think about it like any other career. Like in my nursing career, none of my friends were interested in anything that had to do with brains. <laughs> and like, <laughs> you know, they were just like, oh, she's so nerdy, you know, whatever. Like she does that over there, you know. But in if we were, you know, in a room full of everybody that is into brain stuff, they're all into it, you know. And the internet is a wonderful place for you to find that tribe. Like, so for me, my um, content has always been around people who need to hear the message that I have. Um, and usually it's around helping somebody. So, you know, I just pick my ideal person and then I just speak to them. That's awesome. And Matt, how about you? Have you have you guys thought at all about who the audience is? Uh, we have. We've talked about it um, based on who we've spoken to. It, it appears to be uh, middle-aged white men who are improvisers. Uh, but I mean, what what it comes down to is we do it for the same reason we do improv, which also is not a lucrative business. We do it because we love to do it. And that's it. And once it stops being fun, we'll stop doing it. You know, it's it's we do it for us and hopefully other people are entertained. And if they aren't, that's okay. Like, I don't, I, I hold it against no one. Right. I don't, I, you know, I don't, if I, if I'm like, Hey, you guys listen to the podcast, like uh, this, is, I always bring it up to my friends as in like, um, I'm sure you haven't heard the show, but what we do is blah, blah, blah. And every now and again, someone will be like, Oh yeah, I've listened to an episode or two. And I'm like, Oh great. That's amazing. Like, I just assume that people haven't because I don't expect them to, uh, you know, I, I have no expectation really other than just, is this a good time? Are we having fun doing this? Yes great. Let's, let's do another episode. If we're not, this is, this is getting monotonous or it's not fun anymore. Okay. Then let's, uh, let's move on. You know, so that's, that's really our attitude toward it because I can't, I don't know what the secret sauce is. I don't know what the formula is. I don't know how to advertise. I don't know how to become viral. I don't know how to, you know what I mean? I don't know that where that tipping point is or how you reach it. And I've, I have tried in the past with other projects and even with this project to be like, oh, well, let's do some Facebook marketing or let's do this or let's put it on this form or let's reach out to this person who seems to have a connection to, you know, Wikipedia or whatever. It, none of it seems to really be effective. So I've gotten to the point now where I'm just kind of like, well, it, it, you know, if, if it happens, it happens. And if it doesn't, we had fun. So that's that's it. That's it.
that rules. So I want to, uh, we've talked about money a little bit and I want to, I want to cover that. And um, it, in regards to the actual cost of, of developing a podcast, like uh, what, as, as you all sort of kick this off and I get a kick out of just uh, obviously our listeners cannot see, but right now guided, guided visuals. Uh, there's three different uh, podcasters talking right here, all with three different microphones. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's like, this is just the perfect advertisement for, you know, Amazon marketplace when you Google like podcast starter kit. Um, <laughs> but what, you know, Mariana, you, you're the, you're the OG in this room. Like what was the technology you had to invest in or, or what, what did you have to do to make sure you could sort of hit the ground running to to produce the podcast? Oh my God, I'm so bad. This is the same microphone I had since 2016. <laughs> so almost nothing. Um, like, it really, like you said, it, the barriers are in your head. Okay. Like you don't need the perfect everything. Um, start with what you have. Um, I think this microphone was like, $60 at the time. I mean, and I just got whatever somebody said on a forum to get, you know, and I was like, okay, that that's good. Um, and then, um, besides it, just the microphone and equipment or what else did you just, want me just to cost in general from the beginning? Oh, just in general. Um, initially I think we did lips in, which was like a monthly fee. Um, but then we switched to something that was free, but I couldn't bring all my episodes, um, some of them like got lost in the dust, which is fine. Um, and then, uh, and so that's, I mean, it's, it's all free now. And then, <laughs> um, you know, like I said, I paid for somebody to edit, but it was overseas. So it was relatively inexpensive. Um, and if you have the time and are not a crazy perfectionist like me, maybe you could do your own <laughs> editing, um, and so really it's the initial equipment is the only thing, um, other that I found, um, and I just bought it once and used it for, you know, seven years or six years or whatever, whatever that was. You should celebrate, have. you should celebrate that microphone's birthday. Like, I should. <laughs> awesome. And then, uh, Matt, how about you? Like, what was your sort of initial investment between you and Jethro? So initially nothing. Um, I had that same microphone, Mariana, that you have right there. It's it's back in the the closet behind me because uh, I I about two or three years ago, maybe two years ago, uh, because I do voiceover and because they started doing more record from your own home studio type stuff during the pandemic, um, I upgraded my stuff because I I got a couple of paychecks from some voiceover gigs and I thought well. Okay, let's put that money into some, you know, some new equipment. So I got two new mics and I got like XLR hookups for my computer and a cloud razor and all sorts of, you know, the arm and things like that. Um, so that that's money that I spent, but more because of the voiceover stuff. And now I can use it for podcasting. Um, as far as our actual podcasting expenses go, mostly it's the hosting that we pay for. And, uh, like I said, we did some Facebook ads. Um, we had those rocks glasses that we bought, but, uh, total oh, zoom, we pay for a, a, a yearly zoom subscription. Um, we have spent around $1,200, I would say over the three years that we've been doing this. Um, and, uh, that is also uh, counting the money that we've made through Patreon against that. So, and we don't get a lot. We've had a total of three patrons. Uh, so we don't, we don't make a lot of money through Patreon, but, um, we do make, you know, a little tiny bit here and there. Uh, but yeah, so it's been around, you know, and it, we're, we are fortunate in that we can afford that. Right. So we pay, I think it's about $18 a month for hosting, depending if we go a little over, sometimes it can go up into like the $25 a month type of thing we're able to afford that. Uh, it's very lucky for us that we're able to do that. And, um, now that I'm hearing that there's like places where I could freely host my podcast, I'm, uh, getting a little, I'd like to talk to you a little more, more Mariana. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so that, that's the biggest expense, um, honestly, that, that we have had is the hosting because, um, you know, that, yeah, that was, a, we, we thought that we had to do that. And now I'm, now I'm learning that maybe I didn't. So, 
Yeah, I mean, little little hack that I've heard people have mixed reviews with is that, uh, you know, every time you start a new Google account, you get what, five gigabytes, something like that. And you can host through Google Drive. I know that oh. that's, a, that's a free alternative for hosting. Or if you have, uh, if you do host web space, so I own ryanslamek.com, which is highly under construction right now. Um, but I can use that host that I already pay for to do it. With that said, I do not. Um, you know, personally, I think that uh, there's companies out there that do a better job of making sure my word gets out there than me making sure that every technical issue is taken care of. Well, yeah. And that's that's one of the things that I like about Buzzsprout was that we could like just click some buttons and it was like, great, this will be on Pandora. It'll be on Apple. It'll be on Spotify. It'll be on all these different things. I didn't have to figure out how do I do all of this myself, right? I wrote our description once, I put our picture in once and it put it out to all of those things. So to me, that's worth it, right? To have that type of thing where it's like, yeah, we're going to, we're going to do this, some of this heavy lifting for you. Um, and and it's not heavy lifting for them, right? Because they know how to do it. It's that's their job. But for me to like figure all that out would have taken extra time. It would have taken extra whatever. And probably now, had I realized I was going to be doing it for three years or longer, I probably would have just <laughs> tried to figure that all out back then. But now I'm just now I'm in it. So, you know, I've just kind of come to accept the the eighteen dollars a month is is going to this. Yeah, and the other the other uh, currency we use for this is time, right? I mean, that's a very uh, costly resource um and you know for both of you like i i i'm jealous of your abilities to delegate and your for ability to to say no nah, i'm not going to edit this i'm just going to put it out there i haven't gotten there yet my uh you know i'll talk to my sponsor and see if i can uh, grow up to that at some point um but these are the things that you have to sit there and rationalize like should your hour long episode take you 10 hours of prep work and recording and editing and distribution and social media um or you know to mariana's point should you find somebody on Fiverr or, you know, like I, I know middle schoolers that have these skill sets that, uh, you know, their parents want them to find hobbies <laughs> and you can sit there and say, Hey, do you want to help work on a podcast? Um, intern. The word is intern. Yeah. 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 <laughs> It's the, it's the, uh, I think legally it has to be tied to, I did learn this here. You want to know a little piece of uh, fun trivia, which is at least in New York state, if you have an intern, it has to be legally tied to any sort of educational program. If you have a job shadow, it does not. Um, so oh. if you have a job shadow who's uh, who's who's working with you, it's a different story. Um, you know, the I guess the other thing that I just wanted to put out there, and I'm just curious if you guys have had the, this experience, is that you know, for my show, I'm I'm interviewing people that are that are uh, from all walks of life with all backgrounds, and oftentimes I'm interviewing them because they've created something that I really like. Um, and I do find that for my expenses, uh, I'll have a guest on. And then all of a sudden, my eBay purchases go through the roof as I've bought every book they've ever published, uh, for which I'll look at maybe 17 pages before I interview them. Uh, but I'll have that that sort of thing. And, and to your point, Matt, like uh, I am a fully empo- employed educator, you know, like I have those the ability to afford that. Not everybody does. Um, but have you guys ever run into that where there's sort of secondary expenses that tie in with who's on your show or or anything like that? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I interviewed like Denise Duffield Thomas, which if you don't know, she's like a big money mindset guru in our space in the coaching space. Um, so I did like buy her $2,000 program, like, and then (laughs) when, after being her client for a while, then she agreed to be on my show. So yeah, like there, I mean, but I was going to buy that anyway. You know what I mean? I was going to work on my mindset around money anyway and and do that work anyway. So um, I feel like all of the opportunities that have come have been like kind of like what you said, like they're genuinely things that I wanted to explore. So it's a win win no matter what. Yeah, yeah. Um, I I haven't had it happen a ton because most of the people that we have on our our show are friends or people that we know already. So either we already own everything that they've written, uh, or they haven't written anything. Um, but, uh, we have occasionally, uh, we had some, we had the host of the, uh, the quantum leap podcast on one of our episodes and, um, one of the Matt Dale, who is one of the hosts on there, uh, wrote a book that, um, is called beyond the mirror image. And it is essentially a compendium of quantum leap information like and so much quantum leap information that 
it's 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 almost overload, but I love it because I I love that show. Um, it is uh, it's an amazing book. So I was going to buy a copy of that, but then he recommended another book about Back to the Future. So I ordered that first because his wasn't out yet, or he had a second edition coming out. And then the second edition just showed up at my house. And I was like, oh, this is amazing. Wait, they didn't have my, he couldn't have sent that. And then I found out that Jethro bought me a copy of the book because he was just being a nice guy. Um, so it, you know, that was his expense, I guess. But, um, but no, we haven't had a ton of it. Uh, the biggest thing for me is that I will find myself at the, um, like at the fine wine and good spirits at the liquor store being like, well, I do have a lot of different kinds of bourbons, but I don't have a new one for this week. So maybe I should get this bottle. And, you know, so I have this liquor cabinet full of like these bottles of bourbon that have like two drinks out of them, essentially, because I always want to talk about drinking a new bourbon on the show. Um, it's a bad excuse, but, uh, it, you know, it, it happens. So a uh, little, little bit of extra expense through that, I suppose. Love it. And I want to be mindful of your time. You guys have been so generous. Just a, a couple of follow-ups is that uh, I'm just curious about, um, you know, Mariana, I, I I know you have some projects in the pipeline. I'm not sure if you can talk about them, but is there anything in the, the sort of digital space or the podcast space that you're hoping to grow into uh, in the future? Um, not specifically in the creative space, but I'm sure I will get there. Um, I think since I had that pretty bad burnout in 2021, when things started to like, I started just shutting everything down. Um, I've been on this like wonderful journey of just like finding joy and like experiencing life in a, in a completely different way. So I'm sure something will happen. Um, and I really love being creative. Um, so something will happen in that way. Um, but we did start um, a new business, which is called Online Business Partnership. So we're going to be um, doing marketing for um, small businesses, um, mostly like brick and mortar and local type stuff. Um, but uh, that is a project in the works for sure, but it's not in the creative or podcasting space which will leave all my creative juices to, to meld for a little bit, a little bit longer. Yeah. I, I have faith that you'll find a way to, to bridge that gap. Uh, <laughs> there's no doubt about it. Matt, what about you? What do you, uh, what do you envision for growth or, or goal potentials for, uh, you know, a drunkard's walk? Uh, well, I mean, we want to keep going with it. I mean, that's, that's the biggest thing we, um, we completed season eight, um, a few months back. And, um, that was, I, I actually, I, I think you said that we were coming close to a hundred. We're actually over a hundred episodes at this point. We've recorded about 122 episodes. So, um, we're going to be dropping season nine. Uh, that will debut in October on the 17th. I don't know when this is dropping, but, um, Hopefully it's before that. If not, uh, go catch up. Um, so yeah, so we'll have another season of that. I, uh, like I said, there are a couple other friends of mine that we have started talking about some some other podcast ideas. Uh, one of those is with Dave Foreman. Um, so uh, look for hopefully a uh, a trivia related podcast with Matt Hartman and Dave Foreman coming soon to a podcast broadcast near you. Podcast broadcast. That sounded weird. Um, but uh, but we'll see. We're still we're still very much in the development phase of that. So uh, not sure exactly when that will show up, but hopefully hopefully in the next year or so. All right, I love it. I got two more questions for the two of you. I uh, number one uh, for both of you, where can people find you online if they're interested in sort of a follow up or any questions? And you can just say they can't. I'm invisible. That's permitted. Uh, but Mariana, if people are interested in sort of following up on you, uh, following up with you, maybe learning about online business partnership, where can they where can they track you down? Um, just find me on my Facebook page, uh, Mariana C. Ruiz. I'm a creator on there. Um, I also wanted to say I did find the name of where we were doing our podcast. It took me a little bit, a minute. Um, so it's called Anchor. Okay. Anchor. Um, and it is a free hosting. I mean, it was free up until I did my show. So um, that is, and it does, it goes out to a multiple RSS feeds with one click. Um, and I think what was another cool feature about it, you could customize like intro, outro, or commercials. So um, if we were doing a launch or promotion, we would upload it and it would 
fix it across all episodes. So that was really helpful for our live launch process. Um, all right. So a little commercial for Anchor <laughs> unpaid. <laughs> Well, fun little follow up on that, because I actually uh, when I I feel like I'm in my infancy here, uh, but I, when I was trying to research what what hosts, it turns out that Anchor was purchased by a little company. I think they're going to be big. It's called Spotify. Um, and now uh, Anchor is, is a part of that process. So if you're hosting your if you want to host your podcast through Spotify, it's built on that infrastructure, uh, which I think is sort of interesting. And it does still have free options. Um, and I think it might limit you to your distribution is only through Spotify. Um, but it is that is still there. Um, awesome. Uh, and Matt, where can people find find out about you or find out about the Drunkard's Walk? Uh, well, you can follow Drunkard's Walk on uh, Facebook or Instagram. Um, if you want to reach out to us directly, that's just Drunkard's Walk Podcast at gmail.com. Uh, you can send us an email there. Uh, you can go to our link tree, uh, which is, uh, if you're not familiar with link trees, they're set up as linktr.ee and ours then is slash Drunkard's Walk. And from there, you would find links to all of our um you can go to our merch page, you can go to our Patreon, you can go to our, our uh, Buzzsprout page and, and all sorts of things like that. So that's the best. If you want to find us, go there. Or, I mean, just uh, go to wherever you listen to your podcast, search Drunkard's Walk. Um, if you have an Amazon Echo, I, I won't say the that thing's name <laughs> for fear of turning someone's on, uh, you can ask it to play our episode and it does, which blew my mind when I tried it the first time. Um, but yeah, we're we're available wherever you listen to your podcasts, and uh, we're always looking for for new listeners. And on our link tree, you can find the form you can fill out to give us destination suggestions. And if we pick yours, uh, we'll contact you and uh, bring you on the show and have you be our guest and talk to you a little bit. So if you're interested in that, uh, do it. We'd love we, you know love to love to talk to new people and uh, yeah, need need some new destinations too. That sounds great. And uh, I, I once again just want to thank the two of you for being on the show. This show, uh, obviously, we, we've come on with a very specific theme. Our goal is to talk about podcasting. But um, I always want to just make space at the end of an episode for any topic that might be on your mind, something that either you wanted to cover um, or something that's just been sort of there that you want to sort of send out to the world. So, Marianne, is there anything, anything that we haven't covered or any sort of ideas that you want to put forward before we depart? Um. Oh, gosh. I don't have anything specifically. <laughs> um, just, I think the the biggest thing, I like, I'm just going to be the life coach here for a minute um, about podcasting. And that is like, be yourself, just have fun and like, just let the process flow. Um, because, you know, there's like your voice matters and, and it's important to get your ideas out there. So that's what I want to say. Awesome. And Matt, how about you? Anything that that wants to come out or anything we haven't covered yet? Uh, that was incredibly profound. So I feel like I have to say something, uh, but I, <laughs> I don't know that I can follow that. I guess, I, I guess I'll say, uh, we talked a lot about, uh, improv and improvisation. Um, if, uh, if you've ever thought about getting involved with improv or wanting to be a better public speaker, or just getting a little more confidence, uh, look in your local town for an improv troupe and go take their beginner class. Uh, it's one of the best ways to, to like get into that space even if you don't never want to perform on stage it's so a lot of fun and it teaches you the principle of yes and uh which if you're not familiar with is all about acceptance it's all about taking what is being offered to you and adding to it instead of just denying what you're hearing and i think that's a good principle just in in life in general so um if it can teach you that uh you, you're gonna get your money's worth out of it so so check that out this is why I invite really awesome, interesting people to my show. I can't top either of those. So I just want to thank both of you for being here. This has been great. Thank, thank you, you very much. Well, that was wonderful and allows me to provide a glorious moment of transparency. So in that conversation, we talked about the importance of finding a healthy balance when you're developing media. And let's be honest. I probably don't have a healthy balance when it comes to developing this podcast, but I keep surprising myself and finding new ways to make things more effective. But here I am recording at some would say the witching hour and my audio editor crashed. I lost the last two hours worth of work and thankfully was able to go through, reclaim it, turn three hours work into about 15 minutes of editing because I knew where I needed to make cuts and where I wanted to record. 
But these are the types of things that we want to think about when we're developing podcast media, making sure that we can sort of plan for the inevitable. Uh, believe it or not, I'm recording this outro prior to the night before it drops. Uh, we're in early October right now and are just a little bit ahead of schedule. And that's why we build in these sort of uh, artificial timelines. But I want to thank Matt and Mariana for coming on. Please go through and check out their, uh, their work if you're interested. Additionally, if you like what you're hearing, please check out uh, me on social media. You can find The World of Ryan's Lomac on Facebook and Instagram. You can email me, meditations at ryanslomac.com. And just genuinely help out by sharing, writing a review, and just ensuring that people know what you like about this program. It's going to help get the word out, and hopefully we can have some more interesting conversations. Uh, beaming in, we're going to have our next episode is going to be on October 25th, and we're going to have Kelly Tompkins, the owner and proprietor of Blue Moon Apothecary and Wellness Center in Liverpool. We're going to keep up with sort of the uh, alternative ways of thinking in the month of October during spooky season, and we're going to be talking about that beautiful balance between westernized medicine and holistic medicine, what apothecaries are, what functions they serve for our communities, and different ways we can think about our own health. So I hope you'll tune in. Thanks again for coming. I hope you'll make space for conversation because you just might learn something.